Hello there. So this is um, section 3.3, Kramer's Rule. Um, so this uh, lecture, we're just going to introduce Kramer's Rule, um, go over one type, well, sort of, no, I guess you can call it two applications of, of Kramer's Rule, um, specifically to how we solve uh, systems of equations. Um, then we'll learn an interesting application to engineering and differential equations. Um, yeah, so with that being said, uh, we have a little bit of new notation to introduce um, in order to best talk about what Kramer's rule is. Uh, so we say that for any n by n matrix um, A and any vector B and R n, this matrix A sub I of B is the matrix that we obtain from A by replacing uh, column I with vector B. Um, and so here I've got the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 100, and the vector B, 3, 2, negative 50. Um, and so here, the matrix A sub 2 of B, I should just replace column 2 with B. Um, so not much more to it than that. It's just, I've got an n by n matrix, a vector b whose length should correspond to uh, the number of rows in A, right? So b shouldn't be, uh, it can only be a vector of length three for this to work, of course, in this example. And all you do is you just replace column two with b. So given that definition, what Kramer's rule tells us is the following. That if I have an invertible matrix A, And so if it's invertible, uh, then it's a square, we'll say n by n matrix, uh, that for any b in Rn, I can find the unique solution to the matrix equation AX equals B. Um, is the vector X uh, equals X1 through Xn. So with in individual entries X1 through Xn, where the individual entries are given by the following um, expression, so determinant of a sub i of b divided by determinant of a for each entry in x. So what does Kramer's rule tell us? And so this is a theorem uh, which we will prove here in one second. Um, so Kramer's rule tells us that if we have an invertible matrix and I want to find the solution to this matrix equation, and so um, certainly we have other ways of, of finding these solutions. Uh, we'll look at a, a few specific ways where Kramer's rule can help us. Um, again, you know, maybe using Kramer's rule, especially if we already know the matrix is invertible, isn't always the best way to solve a matrix equation, but uh, we will introduce it, and it's sort of important to understand that this is one way we can attack these problems. Um, so, of course, since A is invertible, we know that this matrix equation always has a solution by the invertible matrix theorem. Um, and so we also know that it always has a unique solution. And so what Kramer's rule tells us is that we can find this solution vector, where here we've called the entries x1 through xn, by calculating each individual entry like so, where I calculate the determinant of the original matrix A and divide that by the determinant where I've replaced A sub I, or where I've replaced column I and A by vector B. By replacing column I and calculating this determinant, this will give me the ith entry of this solution vector. So what I want to first do is prove Kramer's rule. Um, has a really neat proof. Uh, that uses some of the cool properties of determinants we've seen so far. 
and then we'll just look at a couple examples. All right, so there's that. All right, so proof of Kramer's rule. Uh, so we're going to define A again sort of in this column notation that we've seen where A1, A2, up through AN are the columns of A. And we're going to let AX equals equal B for a vector X in RN. And so Notice in particular in this proof, uh, we're assuming that this vector x um, isn't variable, right? So this is a vector containing real numbers. So this is the actual solution vector to this matrix equation. So what I'm going to do is calculate the product of A times the identity matrix whose ith column has been replaced with x. Um, and so what this looks like, well, is A times this matrix. Um, and I'll give you maybe a, a slightly a quick example of what exactly this looks like. So remember the identity matrix. So let's say we were in R3 for a second, is, is this matrix, right? And each of these vectors, E1 through En, are the standard basis vectors. So this is E1, E2, E3. And so notice that, again, just replacing one of these rows with X, say I2, I'm just removing that row, replacing it with X, and then the rest of the rows still are these standard basis vectors. Um, so it'll make sense in a minute why we're starting off by calculating this, because it doesn't necessarily seem related at first. Um, but so that is what this matrix looks like. So this is A, this is this matrix. And so by the properties of matrix multiplication, we can in a sense distribute A through this matrix. And we know that this is the matrix whose columns are given by A times E1, A times E2, A times X, and A times En. Right? And so this is sort of the original definition of matrix multiplication we gave, um, where, again, the columns of this matrix are given by these column vectors. OK. Well. Given how each of these columns work, this implies that this matrix is equal to the first column of A. Notice because the 1 is in the first entry of E1, when I do this multiplication, we're only ever going to pick up the first column of A. Second column is just the second column of A. And that's going to continue until we get to the ith column, where we've put x. But notice, we've already assumed that x, a times x is equal to b. And so this is actually, working through this a little more, equal to this matrix. And so notice that what this um, matrix is, well, is actually just the matrix a sub i, where the i -th column has been replaced by b. So working through this string, we get that A times the identity where I replace x is equal to A where I've replaced B, both in column I. All right, so why does this help? Well, because we can take the determinant of both sides. Specifically, on the right, taking the determinant, I can split up the determinant across the product on the right, as we saw in the last section.
And since these two sides are equal, this relationship must be equal. Well, and so this implies whoop, that dividing by the determinant, determinant of a, that the determinant of a sub i replaced by x is equal to the determinant of a sub i replaced by b divided by the determinant of a. And note that this step is valid because a is invertible, and so I don't have to worry about the determinant of a being zero. This matrix, remember, is a diagonal matrix, almost, where just x uh, column i is replaced by this vector x. And so this determinant, actually, is just equal to the ith entry of x, which is x sub i, and this proves Kramer's rule. So if I want to solve this matrix equation and I want to use Kramer's rule, I could do so like so. All right, so now I just want to look at a couple examples of this. So the first example will be fairly straightforward. Uh, we're just going to solve a system of equations by working through these steps the rule gives us. And the second example will be a little more interesting. I guess they're both interesting, but uh, the second example will be a little weirder. So here we just want to use Kramer's rule. solve the following system of equations. All right, so if I want to do this, and I'm given the problem presented in this way, uh, the first thing I want to do is set it up as a matrix equation ax equals b. Well, and so if I'm going to do this, I know that a is equal to the matrix 5, 7, 2, 4. And b is equal to the vector 3, 1. All right. So to do this, I'm going to need to know the determinant of a. Well, A is a 2 by 2 matrix, so this isn't too hard. 5 times 4 minus 7 times 2. And so the determinant of A is equal to 6. Second step, I want to calculate A sub 1 of B. And so this is going to be the matrix where, again, I replace row 1 of A, or column 1 of A, excuse me, by b, then I want to calculate its determinant, and then I want to do the same thing with um, a sub 2 of b. So here, now I'm going to replace row column 2. I keep saying row on accident, sorry. Column 2 of A by B and calculate that determinant. Uh, and that's equal to 5 minus 6, which is equal to negative 1. And at this point, I'm almost done. Um, let's see, where can I, I think I can make room over here maybe. So by Kramer's rule, I know that x1 is equal to the determinant of a sub 1 of b divided by the determinant of a. 
which is equal to 5 sixths and x2 is equal to the determinant of a sub 2 of b divided by determinant of a and so that means x2 is equal to negative 1 sixth and so in this way using Kramer's rule we can sort of just follow the process given to us and work through a solution of this system all right so this is um, sort of a, a base example of how to use Kramer's rule um, the next example I want to give um, is a little different from what we've seen um, but I think it's a really cool problem so this problem will actually have um, applications to Laplace transforms in differential equations um, so if you've taken diff EQ you've probably heard of Laplace transforms um, if you still have to take diff EQ uh, or are going to take diff EQ uh, then you will learn about Laplace transforms um, so what we want to do here is determine the values of s so example 2 determine the values of s and I'll try to differentiate my s's from 5's as much as possible um, I guess what I'll point out is there are no 5's in this so this is always going to be an s uh, determine the values of s for which the system has a unique solution and then we want to describe that solution so the first step of this process is actually not going to involve Kramer's, Kramer's rule it will only be the second step of this process that involves Kramer's rule and so the system here is s times x1 plus 2s times x2 is equal to negative 1 3 times x1 plus 6s times x2 is equal to 4 uh, that looks too much like a matrix okay so how do we do this so notice that the corresponding matrix to this system or the coefficient matrix in particular um, is a 2 by 2 matrix right so we now know by the invertible matrix theorem that this matrix or that um, the matrix equation so by the invertible matrix theorem in mat them um, if we call this matrix a ax equals b has a unique solution if a inverse exists when does a inverse exist specifically when the determinant of a is non-zero so I know that this system of equations is going to have a unique solution specifically when the determinant of this matrix is not equal to zero well we can figure out for what values of s will this uh, determinant be not equal to zero so notice that the determinant of a is equal to 6s squared minus 6s and so what we want to do right is um, figure out exactly when this 
is true, exactly when the determinant of this matrix is non-zero. To do that, it's probably actually easier to figure out when the determinant is equal to zero, and then just say, well, it holds for all of the other numbers. And so what we want to do for this is set this equal to zero, and then we can do a little bit of factoring. And so this has a solution when s is equal to 0 or 1. So to answer part 1 of this question, the system has a unique solution. Whenever the determinant is non-zero, meaning whenever s is not equal to 0 or 1. So it's kind of cool, right? We have this sort of like unknown parameter that appears many times in our system. And this is one of the huge uses for determinants is that we can actually answer questions like this, right? We can use the determinant to figure out exactly what values of s, where here s is this parameter which appears three times in our system, we can figure out exactly what values of s are gonna give us a unique solution. And the answer is a lot of values of s. There are only two values of s that will give us a non-unique solution. All right, so given this fact, how can we now use Kramer's rule to actually describe those solutions. So since we're going to need to use Kramer's rule, I actually want to solve or save the determinant of A. And what we're going to need to do is calculate a few more determinants. So this is A. So to use Kramer's rule, first we want to calculate A1 of B. We're here b is going to just be my solution vector, negative 1, 4. So this is equal to negative 1, 4, 2 times s, 6 times s. And so the determinant of this matrix is equal to negative 6s minus 8s. So we'll write that here. Now a2 of b. This time I'm going to replace the second. Uh, so this will be s3, negative 1, 4. And so notice the determinant of a2 of b is equal to 4s plus 3. All right, and I'll write that here. And so what it means by describe that solution, well, now that we have um, these two determinants, right? We can actually write out exactly what the solution is going to look like. So any solution to this equation, x equals x1, x2, must satisfy, well, x1 should equal the determinant of a1. over 6s squared minus 6. And if you prefer, you can simplify that uh, just a little bit to uh, negative 7 over 3s minus 3. All right, so every solution must look like this. And x2 must be equal to 4s plus 3. 
divided by 6s squared minus 6s. And so when it says describe the solution in terms of s, or just describe the solution, this is what it's talking about, because we can describe exactly what this solution looks like for all values of s. Even more interesting, notice that the specific values of s that we had to eliminate uh, that correspond to a unique solution specifically would sort of ruin this, because if s was equal to 1, then I'd get two denominators equal to 0. And actually, same thing before I simplified here. If s was equal to 0, each of these denominators would also equal 0. So we can determine when the system has a unique solution here. And we can describe the solution like this.